So at this point in the breeding process with our, our roots from the cross, we want to self-pollinate them. This will give us uh, quite a lot of information uh, because essentially we'll, we're, well, just as it said, self-pollinating. So this plant is receiving its own pollen. So the parents of this, all of the seed that come off of this single flower inside the bag will be uh, male and female are the parent plant. So a self-pollination then, when you, when you plant that seed out, which we're going to do when we, we'll harvest the seed in July, plant it out in the field, let it go through the winter, just like Nash's normal crop does, and then we'll get a snapshot of what the potential genetics of this plant are for good tall, strong tops, good flavor, good hardiness, uh, and, and of course a good healthy carrot. So the mechanics of doing this is you, you prune away uh, secondary umbels that are coming up. These are, by the way, this is an umbel, this is a compound umbel on a carrot uh, plant and it has a whole series of small little, here you can see it on here, a series of stems with little, uh, these are called umbelettes and uh, each of these umbelettes then has about a dozen to, to uh, 20 flowers on it. Little individual, per, what are called bisexual or perfect flowers, which have both male and female parts. So there's both the pollen, the pollen being produced from anthers, and there are the, um, the stigmas there that are, that's essentially where the pollen germinates and uh, grows down into the ovule to, uh, to produce a, a new embryo, sans a seed. So in order to get these self-pollinated, we're enlisting the help of ho common houseflies. And what we do is we, put, we buy these uh, very nicely made uh, thin plastic bags with thousands of holes in it. I don't know if you can see from the video, but they're perforated with thousands of tiny little holes. So it's completely breathable, but the holes don't allow any pollen to come in from outside the bag or leave the bag and go out. And it also then contains the flies so that they're in there as captive uh, feeders on the pollen and the nectar. Flies, by the way, are very good pollinators. Common house flies, as well as many of the other related species of flies in the, wi in the wild, as well as a whole other uh, uh, family of flies called the hoverflies. Uh, anyway, the houseflies are, we then introduce the houseflies by having a little corner of the bag, which I will open for you. I'm not going to let any houseflies out. I'm opening this. See, this is twist, twist tied shut. We have a little open hole here. And every week or so, we put a teaspoon of fly pupae down into that hole which are sitting now down here you can see the, the pupae. Most of it is empty where flies have hatched out of it. And those pupes will stay in there if the weather conditions, if the environmental conditions of the greenhouse are right, warm enough and a little bit of moisture in the air, they'll hatch out just beautifully. And the first thing they do is go straight to the flower for nectar and for pollen. And that's how they feed and they can live up to three weeks inside this bag. And it essentially takes about three weeks to do it. We'll add some new pupes every week just to make sure we have plenty of flies in there. Unless there's plenty of, plenty of flies already and then we don't have to necessarily wait. Okay, so the next step in this process is to, after the flies have pollinated actively for about three weeks, uh, and that's all the time that you'd ever need to get every flower in there pollinated. Then uh, we simply, once we know that no more flowers are opening and they've all uh, essentially formed seed, then we take the bags off and we allow them to cure and to mature the seed naturally on the plants. And um, at that point, when the seed is fully mature, sometime in July, we will then come in and we will harvest the single umbels off of each plant, give them a numerical number to keep track of 
which umbel the seed came, which plant the seed came from. And that seed will then be cleaned individually. We'll never mix the seed. Each plant will have a separate brown bag that we keep the seed in, clean it, and then put it into an envelope. And each of those envelopes will go to the field and we'll have a series of 120 rows of carrots planted, each row representing the seed out of just one of these bags, which represents the progeny of just one of these plants. And these so-called progeny rows will then, they'll all be marked in the field with a stake, and we will then inspect them through, through the growing season of how strong, how tall, how rugged their tops are, and then once they've gone into the winter, to their normal harvest date, into late February or March, because we want to find out which are the toughest ones all through winter, then we'll dig up the row of carrots and we'll inspect the roots and we'll do a selection. And we will then make a decision on which of those rows have good enough carrots for our, de for our uh, desired outcomes in order to select and go to the next step in the breeding process. Okay, we learned quite a bit there from Dr. John in the greenhouse about the organic carrot breeding project we have going on at Organic Seed Alliance with Nash's Organic Produce in Squim, Washington. Uh, and the Novik Breeding Collaborative that John is a part of. I want to talk a little bit about the benefits of breeding for organic systems. What do we want out of our, our organic varieties as gardeners, as farmers, uh, and as eaters of organic food? First off, uh, any good variety has to meet the environmental conditions in which it's grown. It's got to be able to compete against the pests in its region, the weed competition, the pathogens. In organic systems, we specifically don't have the synthetic spray-on solutions that conventional agricultural uh, farmers do have. We instead look at things holistically, so we look at the environment in a holistic manner, and our breeding projects begin with that as the basis. Secondly, we have to have the right agronomic uh, traits for the farmer. In the case of the carrot with Nash, you heard John talk about breeding for weed competition. Uh, you heard about the importance of good, not only tall tops to shade out weeds, but also strong tops for his cultivator uh, and also the harvesting of his carrots at the end. And also John mentioned uh, Nash's market conditions. We have to breed for specific regional local market conditions. Nash is trying to fill a niche in producing carrots for uh, the Northwest in the winter time. So we have to breed a carrot that does well in the cool wet falls uh, and in the ground throughout the winter remains sweet and flavorful and that brings us to the market conditions. What do we as eaters want from our produce? And indeed we do want tasty carrots. Uh, we want uh, colorful carrots. We want nutritious carrots. Uh, in addition to this breeding project that John talked about, we also are, are working on some colored carrot varieties that have different nutritional profiles, uh, as well as being quite beautiful, purples, reds, yellows, oranges. Uh, we also have to breed for, uh, in an ethical and an integrated way that respects social values uh, of organic agriculture. Uh, in specifically, we want to uh, respect the integrity of the plant, not to cross that gene barrier by inserting genes from another species. We don't need to do that in organic agriculture to breed successful crop varieties for our farmers. We don't do it. We also have an ethical approach of making sure the farmer is involved in our breeding projects from the ground up. Uh, very important because farmers have been removed from seed systems over the last hundred years and I told the specialists will take care of it for them, but we find that farmers like Nash want to be involved in their seed choices and the breeding of their uh, crop varieties that are important to their farm. And finally, we really want to uh, be breeding in the public interest. We want varieties that are owned by the public, that are in the public domain, that don't have patents, that can be shared amongst farmers, other seed companies, to continue to breed and improve varieties in an evolutionary fashion so that our varieties continue to improve and evolve with the changing environment uh, as well as the changing needs of us as gardeners, farmers, and as eaters. So appreciate you watching this. We appreciate your support for Organic Seed Alliance and the work we do in breeding for organic agriculture.